Our keynote speaker today is someone I really enjoyed working with in my role at Education Commission of the States. Dr. James Lane has a rich education career marked with several honors, including being recognized as the 2017 Virginia State Superintendent of the Year. He is a strong advocate for arts and education. He played trumpet in the marching band while attending the University of North Carolina, where he got into music education. And James began his teaching career as a band teacher before moving into administration as the school's assistant principal. His passion for helping schools improve led him to assistant superintendent and superintendent roles before moving into his current role serving as Virginia's superintendent of public instruction and is also the secretary of the State Board of Education in Virginia. In 2018, Dr. Lane engaged with the Education Commission of the States and the Hunt Institute on a project called Virginia is for Learners, not lovers, Virginia is for Learners. A major review of key issues in Virginia around five major initiatives that included support for early learners, training K-12 students to go deeper in their learning, preparing Virginia graduates for what comes next, making student success the highest standard for all schools in the state, and maximizing the potential for all students. And James is not one to toot his own horn, so I want to do that for him a little bit. Along with his great work as being a band director and now working in politics as one of the superintendents for Virginia, he also continues to play the trumpet. And in 2016, James and his former band, The Castaways, were inducted into the Carolina Beach Music Awards Hall of Fame. I'm extremely honored to welcome our next keynote speaker to the stage. Please join me in welcoming Dr. James Lane. Well, good afternoon, everyone. It's great to see you. I, I have to say I'm now uh, super impressed with the ECS researchers because uh, finding out about the camis is, uh, is a pretty minute detail in my past, but I, but I can tell you that when, when, when the castaways were, um, were inducted, that was, a, that was a huge opportunity, so I, I hadn't heard anybody talk about that in a long time. Uh, the, uh, I often tell people when I, when I give talks that I'm a band director that gets to be state superintendent because uh, teaching music was definitely the, the best job I've ever had and the most, most meaningful. And to this day, I, I have a rule with my former students that I will not follow them on social media or allow them to friend me on, on social media unless they've graduated and are in a career. And, um, and so I've, I've, I've held to that rule and What's been really cool over the years is now many of them are matriculating into their careers, is how many of them are musicians or involved in music some way, either DJs or managing music groups or doing recording and just, uh, uh, one, of, one of the things I'm most proud of is, is watching my students flourish in their music careers. And then the rest of them uh, remind me, well, we're still musicians because we play the radio. Uh, so, so. But one of the things that I believed as a band director was that my job was not just to teach music, not just to teach critical thinking and creativity. My job was to prepare the next, ad, the next generation of advocates for the arts. And I, I thought about my band classroom every day and I wanted it to be fun. So when the first trumpet player one day became a school board member, they would continue to fight for the arts like, like I did. Because uh, my, my arts education is so important to, to who I've become. Uh, and I can tell you that I, I honestly don't believe I would be here speaking to you as the state superintendent of Virginia if I didn't have the experiences that I had in the arts. And so uh, I'm gonna talk for a second about some of the things going on in Virginia that Jeremy mentioned. Uh, but I, I'll tell you a little story. As I was driving up here, I have a communications team and they had put together some things they wanted me to say. And I looked at it before I started to drive up here and I thought, uh, no, this isn't gonna work. So I've totally redone this thing and so I'm seeing these slides for the first time uh, because, because I called them as I was driving up here and I said, no, these are, th these are arts advocates. They need, they, they need to hear what's really going on. And so I'll get into that in a minute and tell you, tell you some stories about, 
about my uh, music education experience as well, for those of you that haven't been in a classroom in a long time. And so, Jeremy mentioned Virginia's for Learners, and uh, Virginia's for Learners is a campaign that we launched to make sure that everyone knew what we were trying to do in improving and enhancing education in the Commonwealth. And what we found is, Virginia has, has made huge leaps and bounds in education. Uh, Virginia was named the number one state for business just a couple months ago. But if you look inside that, that ranking of being the number one state for business, we were identified as having the number one workforce and the number one education system. And so you, you're probably familiar if you're working a state agency, even, even when you're at the top, you don't get told that very often. Uh, and so what, what we wanted to do is make sure that it wasn't just our superintendents, our principals, and our teachers that knew what was going on in our schools. We wanted every family. And so Virginia's for Lovers, which Jeremy referenced, is the Tourism Corporation slogan about uh, getting folks to come to Virginia so that they can learn about our rich history, our beautiful beaches, our great mountains. But Virginia's for Learners is about getting them to learn about our education system so that they won't just come visit Virginia, but they'll stay and raise their family and bring their business because of the high quality system of education that we provide. And the arts are a huge piece of that. Virginians for Learners is built on three pillars. The first is we want to make sure our students are going deeper. Uh, we heard from parents many, many times that, uh, you know, we have to move beyond just preparing these kids for these tests. We've got to make sure they have a well-rounded education. We've got to make sure they have a basis in the humanities and the arts. We have to make sure that they have a basis in STEM. But more than anything, we want kids to have five critical skills. Creative thinking, critical thinking, communication, collaboration, and then Virginia added a fifth C, citizenship. And so the next thing that we're focused on is making success the highest standard for our students. And so we completely, certainly with, with, with the new flexibility in ESSA, completely revamped our accreditation system to give more credit to students that are making steady progress towards our benchmarks uh, and, and frankly, uh, more, more flexibility for our schools that are making steady progress toward, towards the benchmarks. But, but the other thing that we wanted to do is even as we opened up flexibility and we went away from the hammer of denying schools accreditation and opened up the flashlight of accrediting schools with conditions that are no longer denied accredited schools in Virginia. What we wanted to do with that new flashlight was provide more intensive support from the department so that we could help schools. And part of that is making sure that schools understand that it's not just about those, those items that are assessed through our official assessment mechanisms. It's the type and, and whole education that we provide to our students every day. And then we want to make sure our students are prepared for what comes next. And so if they have those five critical skills, if they have a, a high quality school, then we believe that we can maximize their potential if we give them experiences in schools to launch their career. This is a little graphic that we created about those five C's, uh, but this is, this is the core tenet of where we're going in Virginia. You will not hear us talking about uh, 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 you know, focusing on, on new assessments or, 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 or whatnot. We are focused every day on whether we change an assessment, whether we change a standard, whether we put anything in place, it has to have a basis in these five critical skills that we want for students. And I can tell you, as a former arts educator, and, and, and believe me, I'm gonna talk a lot about music education today because that was my background. I fully recognize to, to, to my friends in orchestra and chorus and, and, and uh, and, 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 the, and the, the visual arts and the such, and the theater arts. I, I recognize your importance, but I'm just gonna talk about my band experiences because I feel like those are great stories. But I, but I can tell you as a principal, when I started getting up and talking about band, folks were like, what about chorus? What about theater? So, I, <laughs> so I, I, if y'all will forgive me and give me some leeway there, you know, you know I care about you. Uh, but, but so what, I, what I'm gonna talk about next is what the, why I feel like arts education is so important, what we should be communicating to our communities, and, uh, and, and how the arts are an essential component of the five C's. I probably don't have to say much around why the arts are about creativity and collaboration and communication. Some of that will be obvious. 
The other thing I will say is there are probably a hundred things that I can name about the arts and music that, that benefit students' lives. And I'm not going to go through all 100. I'm going to go through some of my favorites. So please don't, don't hold me accountable for forgetting your favorite reason that the arts are important. Because these, the, the, these are mine. And so I, I'll tell you a, a, a funny story about how I became a teacher. Uh, as, uh, as a musician, uh, I was on the road. I, I did play with the Castaways, which probably the biggest thing that I learned from the Castaways was how to get along with 50-year-old people as a 20-year-old person. And, and, and when you spend 16 hours on a, on a bus with them, uh, you can get along with anybody. Uh, but, but, the, but the other thing about, about playing music that I learned was um, the musicians don't make any money. Even, even the musicians that, that you know really well, except for the super famous ones like, like, like Taylor Swift and Jay-Z, who owns his own record company, uh, most musicians are, are, are living gig to gig. And, and that was true in my situation. You know, I was playing with the castaways on the weekends. I was playing at jazz clubs on Tuesday and Wednesday nights. I was doing recording sessions during the day when I got lucky. I was trying to practice six hours a day because that's what John Coltrane did and that was supposed to do something for me. And, uh, and, and, uh, and at the end of the day, uh, it, it was a difficult life. And, and I had no benefits. I, I met my wife on the road and then we were later at, at, at Carolina together as well. And she was a trumpet player as well. Uh, so our kids are destined to be trumpet players. Uh, but but I, I realized that, um, that, that that life of being on the road and being on buses all the time wasn't for me. And so I, I applied for my first band job in Durham, North Carolina. Any North Carolina people here? Okay. okay. Uh, and so it, and I, in Durham, North Carolina, I went to a school because uh, I, wanted, I wanted to go somewhere where I could have more impact than just going to the best band program. And so I applied for a school that, that did not historically have a strong band program. I went in the interview, of course I killed it, uh, but when I got out of the interview, the, the principal was very nice. She said, you know, we'll, we'll take your application under advisement, you've never taught before, you're just out of school, this is a very competitive job, so thank you for applying. And I started walking back to my car. The assistant principal came running out and he said, hey, the principal wanted me to, to let you know that you're the only applicant, so you can't leave without telling us that you're gonna take the job. <laughs> so that's how I became a band director. And uh, when I got there, I figured out that the band program only had 25 students, right? And they said, you've gotta get the numbers up or we won't have a band program. And I will tell you that the, the greatest threat to the arts in a lot of ways is not, in my experience, administrators' willingness to fund it. It's often talked about that way. It's our ability to, to, to sell our programs and put all that onus on the arts teacher in the school. When really it's on all of us to build those programs. It's on all of us to help families understand why the arts are as important as other options that kids have. But I took on that challenge and, and they said, so you're gonna teach these 25 students, but you're gonna to have to teach math and English remediation because we don't have a full schedule for you yet. I said, don't worry, there will be 100 kids in band next year. <laughs> and so I, I taught math and, and, and English remediation that first year. I also taught strings, which is not my forte, but when you go to music ed school, you learn to play every instrument, so I was, I was prepared. And, and over, over, the, over the years that I taught there, we went from those 25 students in band to nearly 350 students in the band program in a school of 600 kids, right? And we, we took kids that had never left the Durham city limits, and we, we went and won competitions, which, you know, music, music necessarily shouldn't be competitive, but, you know, those of us that do band, it, it happens. Uh, we took kids to Disney World, that, that had only ever seen that castle in a cartoon, right? And, and the, uh, the experiences that we opened up for kids, I can still remember, even though we went to Orlando, we took a, a side trip over to the beach because I wasn't gonna let these kids that had never seen the ocean not see it. And I remember when we stepped off the bus to look in their eyes when they saw it for the first time. 
And so I'm going to talk about some of the benefits, but, but just understand that, that I can't underscore what the experience is like every single day because that's what matters most to the kids. And, and I can tell you, whether it was high school band or middle school band, there are kids who the only reason they come to school is for that band class or that art class or theater. You know, I care about you too. So. And so first I will say the bit, one of the main benefits of arts education to me is, is learning teamwork and leadership. Um, they, I did go to the University of National Championships, uh, <laughs> which, which is depicted here. Um, and, and welcome to Virginia. I'm in Virginia now. Virginia won the National Championship last year, so I'm a you know, huge Virginia fan too. But uh, I don't, this is, this is a picture of the UNC marching band, but I was at the bottom of the end because the trumpets are always in the middle, up front, playing the melody. And so that very well could be me in the picture, I don't know. But, uh, uh, but probably not because the camera looks too sharp. Uh, and that was a long time ago. But I will tell you that being in band, and specifically marching band, was an experience for me that uh, I, don't, I don't know, other than the sports that I played, how I could otherwise have gained the leadership skills that I would have otherwise gained. And, you know, whether it was being the section leader or, you know, later on uh, being, being a conductor, working with my peers who had no reason to want to follow me as a 15-year-old trumpet player taught me so much about, uh, about how leadership is not about getting people to do what you want them to do. It's about inspiring them to want to do it. And that, that's how I thought about music when I was teaching. My job isn't to get you to play your scales or get you to play this, this, this piece correctly. My job is to inspire you to want that piece to be incredible. And so, so teamwork is a huge component of what we do in the arts. It built a growth mindset. Uh, on, on the, I, I taught middle school, right? So uh, at, least in, at least in North Carolina, the kids came in with no instrumental experience uh, other than ORF and whatnot in, in the elementary grades, uh, really no experience on their instrument. So we, we approached every day as if they knew nothing about music, even though they had a great uh, experience in the music in the elementary level. We went from teaching uh, uh, every good boy does fine and face on day one. If you don't know what that is, ask a music educator. Uh, uh, to, to how to structure your embouchure to make that first sound. And there's no more exciting experience than the first time a kid puts their, their, their mouth on that instrument and makes, and makes a noise. And, it, and, it, and it's incredible to watch a month later when they're able to play full whole notes and, 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 and a few songs that, that their parents might know. And as much as it probably drives their parents crazy to go home and hear them practice, but the best experience is that winter concert where you work with a group of kids who six months ago knew nothing. They couldn't read one note, they didn't know one fingering, they didn't know what a valve was, and they play their first concert. And there's nothing more incredible than watching a kid light up and understanding what having a growth mindset is. Because if you can go from knowing nothing to playing a concert and making your parents proud, you realize that perseverance and so many of the other attributes that are necessary to be successful are a part of just seeing things as a process and how you can always get better. The arts teaches emotion and empathy. Now, I was talking to my wife last night about this presentation and, and, uh, and I joked about bringing my trumpet and playing a little bit and, uh, and she convinced me not to do that. It was a great idea. That's why you have a wife. And, and, uh, uh, but, but what I will tell you is, in, in, in music for me, we played the Disney show tunes and the, and the songs of the day. Um, I can still remember when my band director brought out Karate Kid and, and we played You're the Best, right? <laughs> You're the best around. We all know what I'm talking about, right? <laughs> and, and so, uh, but it was also in band that we got to play that very slow, melodic, emotional song for the first time. And I began to have an appreciation for, 
how people felt and the stories of how the music was written. Right? It allowed me to have empathy in learning the experiences of other people. And we don't talk a lot about the need to teach emotion and empathy in schools, but there is no better way to do that in the arts. And I, I, I will tell you, I, I, do, I have a 10 year old and a four year old now, and they, they play piano, you know, we're getting to the age where they're gonna be trumpet players. But, um, <laughs> but my, I was at Scouts with my son the other night, and the scout leader for his den said, uh, take one of the scout oath laws and, and uh, tell us what it means to you and, and you know, write, write something that, that you can share. So the kids went off in the corner and my, so my son had picked cheerful and, and his teacher is teaching sketch noting, which probably some of you know what that is. And that's essentially where you take notes and, and draw your notes. And he sketch noted cheerful. And, and it was at that moment that I saw how much more powerful he felt ab about being able to express his emotions through arts because my son is very shy. The arts provides you with multicultural experiences. I, I can tell you that I, I learned genres of music I would have never ever considered because of the experiences that I had. When I, when I decided to play music, I, just, I, I played jazz. And if you, if you know anything about jazz musicians, every night is a different band, right? Uh, jazz musicians are freelance, and so I had an every Tuesday gig at a wine bar in Chapel Hill, and it was everything I could do to get my band full every week. We had different drummers that were on call, but what it allowed us to do was just learn so much from each other, and everybody brought a different flair. But over the years, because I played with all different musicians, I got invited to be in Same Kumba, which was a salsa cumbia band. I got invited to be in reggae bands. I got invited to, to experience cultures and work with people in ways that I never could have. And we, we would always say to each other, it, it doesn't matter where you came from, music is, is an international language that everybody understands. And with, with few cultures, most of it is based around the same chromatic notes. And so it's an opportunity for kids to learn not, not just about the history of a culture, but what it feels like to be a part of a culture. Music improves, the, the best research on music, for those of you that are researchers, talks about spatial intelligence. But there's a growing body of research about the, the cognition that students, that students learn. Uh, you know, the, there's not a musician I know that hasn't had to memorize something. Your memory skills become incredible. But I'll tell you, I'm gonna go into a few, a few of the cognitive attributes that I think are so important. And creativity and innovation, you know, in so many ways are born in the arts. I, I will say all the time, cultures are generally remembered for a couple things. They're remembered for the wars that they fought, and we teach that pretty well though I wish we taught a deeper history and we're going to work on that in Virginia. But they also teach the cultural advancements, right? So when you learn about uh, France and the, Na the Napoleon era, you learn about Napoleon's wars and you learn about the amazing painters of the time, right? And those are the key things. Well, our students have to realize that for, 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 for us, for where we are today, we're, we're writing our own story of, of, of what we want to be remembered for. And, and, and the music that's being, that really is being driven in this world right now is being driven here in the United States. And so how are we going to not be the next generation of robotic music creators? Not, not that electronics can't be very creative. That's not, I'm, that's not the road I'm going down. How can we make sure that kids are still getting those creativity experiences? Well, if we say that one of our five C's is creativity, there's no way to do that better than through the arts. Now, again, I'm a, I'm a jazz musician, and I can tell you that uh, on a regular basis, I will walk out of a very stressful meeting in a very difficult situation we're dealing with, and there will be a camera right in my face to ask me a very difficult question. And I can, I can say there's no way that I could be as confident 
with, with what I'm answering, if I didn't have those improvisation skills, I'll learn in music, right? And improvisation, again, is not about making up an answer that, that's totally new. And a lot of people think of improvisation being that way. Improvisation is taking those same 12 notes and creating a pattern that's beautiful, right? And so, so for me, those skills that I got playing four hours a night in, in clubs starting in late high school and on into college taught me to be more confident in my ability to think on my toes, which is an incredible skill in the workplace. But in writing music, I learned to express myself and tell a story that couldn't be told any other way. Another benefit of education, this might speak to more of our state education folks, we were doing performance assessment before performance assessment was called. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm loving all this, this new innovative performance assessment. But I, I will tell you that uh, there is no way that you're going to learn how to play your instrument by writing your scales down. There's no way you're going to learn your instrument by simply walking in and, and telling the band director how to play your instrument. The only way that you can assess a student's growth, not their ability, is by actually hearing them play. But the other cool thing is, we were doing project-based learning before project-based learning was cool too because there's really no way that you can understand music, at least in the band setting, playing by yourself. You are a part of the whole, but you can't understand harmony without two trumpet players. You can't really understand rhythm without a percussion section to be there for you. You can't understand the difference between melody and counterpoint, syncopation and crescendos, and everything else that we teach without doing that in a collaborative atmosphere and learning together. And, and so performance assessment is where we want all of our students to go because we say that that is gonna be the way that they can truly show their learning. And I, I use examples of performance assessment history all the time. I say, the state assessment in Virginia asks questions in history that sound like this. Who was the 16th president of the United States? Now, you're all musicians, hopefully, at least you play the radio, and so I'm not gonna ask you to answer that, but the answer is Abraham Lincoln, right? 16th president of the United States. Now, wouldn't we rather know who was Abraham Lincoln and what impact did he have on the future of civil rights? And that's, that's how we describe performance assessment. Well, what we're doing with kids, if we don't create that in every course type, this, this focus on deeper learning, is we're essentially walking in and asking, what note is, this, is the second bar of the treble clef? Right? But wouldn't we rather know, can you play a G for me and then play a scale, a major scale and a Dorian scale from there? Of course we would. And so we would never think of teaching music education that way. So we should never think of te teaching our other subjects that way. And so we should be encouraging our music educators to teach folks how to approach instruction because music educators have been approaching instruction with this new and innovative way because it's the only way that anyone would have ever thought to teach it. We thought about teaching all these other concepts in these rote ways because, because we did it based on an outcome that wasn't even the outcome that we wanted for kids. So, we were doing performance assessment before performance assessment was going on. <laughs> now, the other thing that we do, and I mentioned this a little bit briefly, is we're preparing the future advocates for arts education. And I, I describe this story to you of my students and how they are, many of them are musicians now. But here's the really cool thing about that. They're all starting to have kids, and. They're, you know, their, their kids are starting to get into music and whatnot. Uh, and, and I just can't imagine one of them going to their local middle school or high school or elementary school or whatever, and, and someone trying to tell them that they weren't gonna have a band experience. 
And the kids that I talk with literally revolt in the streets because it's too much a part of what defines them as people to not be a part of their experience. And so every time that we're talking with, with groups that, that advocate for the arts, prepare students for the arts, teach in the arts, we've got to remember that advocacy is our job because it's too easy to fall back on the four core subjects being the focus of our educational experience. But the, but the real education happening in our schools is happening all around those subjects and embedding culture and music and all those things into those subjects. And so, I quote in a video, and, I, and then I'm, I know I'm gonna take some questions, but here, here's one of my favorite quotes, and I don't mean for this to be political, but this one just really speaks to me. Uh, and, and so you can read it there. But uh, we, we often like to say that project-based learning should be the entree, not the dessert. Right, you probably heard somebody say that. Well, that's, that's what the First Lady is saying here, is that it shouldn't, be, it shouldn't be a dessert, it shouldn't be something special that kids get, it shouldn't be something extra that we add on. The art should be a part of every child's core experience in school because it defines so much of who they will be. and not the instructor. So at the end, I want you to say, ah. I've seen the culture shift in our schools. It's just good teaching to use arts and music and drama as a way to connect content to kids. The comprehension has increased. Their interest in reading has increased. I actually have seen my children grow. I really think that arts integration is the tool that's going to be the fuel for our engine, put kids on a different life path, and, and expand opportunity for, for all of our kids. Some students are really kinesthetic learners, and so to move with their body helps them to remember the steps that they need to follow to follow the standard algorithm. You're going to think about what you just did in the dance to help you remember how to do this problem. Okay. Not all of the kids are performing really well academically, but through the arts, we're finding their strength. I love dancing, so that really helped me improve in what I'm not like, really good at. We've seen an increased attendance and decreased behavior problems. It's really been fantastic. So that was a, that was a video that a, a vendor sent me. So if you're in the room, thank you for allowing me to use that. I take no credit for that. The OE didn't film that. But, but, but what I will say is I thought it did a really great job of explaining so why this is, is so important to us. So one of the things that I wanted to do was to leave you with some potential policy things to think about. Uh, ECS did a 50 state comparison on arts education data. You probably heard that this week. Uh, and in Virginia, you, you know, they had the, you were a number one if you're doing everything, you were a two if you were doing some of it, so on and so forth. We were number one in, in, in sharing with people what our, uh, in, you know, what our course lists are. But we were a number two in actually knowing uh, access to, uh, to, to the available courses. And I think that as an arts ed education community, we've gotta make sure that we have data. And I don't mean creating tests and student performance data. But the first thing that I think we need to do from a policy standpoint is know how many students are enrolled in the arts at every school in your state. Now, I don't know the answer to this in Virginia yet. Certainly, I have some authority over this. Oh, and by the way, Kelly Bazonio is our new fine arts coordinator. She could be here today, she could be here tomorrow. She's new, so somebody, somebody look up her and, let, let, and make a friend there, because she's awesome. Uh, but, uh, but, but we're, we're going to work on this in, in Virginia to have a better sense of it. But, but if I had to predict what's going on, and I, so this is a prediction, this is, this is not necessarily a fact, I would predict that we have lower access in rural communities and higher poverty communities. And, and that, that doesn't mean that there aren't opportunities for students to choose it. It means that be, because of a variety of issues, either kids aren't choosing it, are being forced into other things, or, or, or especially in rural, there aren't, a, there aren't as many opportunities, right? You may have a music class in middle school, but you have one music class that you can choose in middle school in, in some of our rural communities. And so what is our responsibility to make sure that we have equity and access? You've heard me talk a lot about Virginia's for Learners and a lot of things we're working on. What it's really about is equity for us. 
right? We believe at the Department of Ed in Virginia that equity is not a thing that we're going to do. It's a lens that we're going to put on everything. And arts education is no different. We need to make sure we have that same equity lens on the experiences that we provide to students. Because at the end of the day, if they're going to have this well-rounded education, if they're going to have this meaningful life, they're going to have to have some basis in the arts. And so for that, we all have to be advocates. So thank you for having me today. Jeremy's going to come up. I know we're going to do a little bit of Q&A. If you have questions about things I've said, here's my contact info, including Twitter. And I uh, just really appreciate, as a former band director, to stand in front of arts education advocates and leaders around the nation is just a huge honor for me. So thank you for having me.